two weeks. And uh, I'm Milin Tambe, I direct the, the center and uh, we would love to hear your ideas on uh, additional events we should hold. Uh, we have many other, in addition to the seminar series, we'll have some workshops uh, that are upcoming. And in the spring, we have a rising star series as well. Uh, we look forward to your ideas. So with this, I'm gonna hand this over to Shalmali to talk up, uh, to introduce our speaker for today. Great, um, let's get started. Um, thank you, Melin, and uh, thank you, Marzia, for being here. Um, uh, let me just start out by first and formally saying Marzia is just an incredible uh, researcher, mentor, and a friend. And formally, she's an assistant professor in the electrical engineering and computer science department, as well as the Institute of Medical Engineering and Science at MIT. She is also a Vector Institute faculty member holding a Canadian CIFAR AI chair and the Canada Research Chair. She holds uh, the Herman L. F. Von Helmholtz Career Development Professorship and was also named MIT Tech Review's 35 Innovators Under 35. Uh, previously, she was a visiting uh, researcher at Alphabet's Verily and a professor at University of Toronto. Uh, she got her PhD from MIT, uh, and before that, she got her uh, MSc in Biomedical Engineering from Oxford as a Marshall Scholar and a BS from computer uh, in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering as the Goldwater Scholar in at New Mexico State University. She has served as the New Rips, um, workshop co-chair and is currently the general chair of ACM Conference on Health Inference and Learning. She rightfully named it CHILL. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Gassimi has a well-established academic rec uh, track record across computer science and clinical venues. Uh, everyone is probably familiar with her work already. Um, her work has been featured in popular press such as MIT uh, News and Media Huffington Post. And with that, uh, the floor is yours, Marcia. Thank you. Thank, so much you. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. I, <laughs> uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, the work that my group does. Uh, I focus on robust private and fair machine learning in a healthcare setting. Um, and they're all interrelated, both in a technical sense, but also in our um, English language understanding of those words, uh, especially in a healthcare setting. And so I'm going to focus on how we could make AI potentially the fairest of them all um, and look at privacy data and how that works with machine learning and health. Uh, so, sorry, was there a, no? All right. So let's take a look at how we do learning um, in this space for machine learning in healthcare. Usually what we do is we get some sort of clinical data and we get it either from practice or knowledge. And when I say practice, I mean, we watch a doctor practice or we download all of the electronic healthcare records from a hospital. When I say knowledge, I mean a randomized control trial or maybe publications in top medical journals. And then we train machine learning models and then we predict events and treatments, right? So you've seen these, um, but let's focus on this this thing over here, this very first thing that I said, right? Getting clinical data from practice and knowledge. When we get clinical data from knowledge, what happens is let's take the gold standard that most treatments are based on, which is a randomized, or we, what we hope most treatments are based on a randomized controlled trial. Randomized controlled trials are actually really rare. So 10 to 20% of the ICU treatments that we see are based on RCTs. And that's not because we don't want more evidence in medicine. It's because these are really hard to do. Um, the way you do a randomized control trial is very expensive because it has to be highly controlled. When you do a randomized control trial, because you're trying to tease out the effect of a very specific treatment, often every other variable is controlled very tightly. So for example, only 6% of asthmatics would have been eligible for their own treatment RCT. So 94% of people that are currently treated under these guidelines would have been ineligible to be part of the RCT that was used to design the treatment. And again, that's because when you're trying to measure some sort of effect, you try to hold everything else constant. And finally, even once you do, uh, you know, an RCT or whether, you know, you have some, some practice that's being uh, generally done in healthcare, 
Um, there are these things called medical reversals. And so uh, over 10% of the 3000 plus top journal studies in things like Lancet, JAMA, the New England Journal in the top uh, in, in the past 10 years have been these medical reversals where uh, some practice like administering estrogen to postmenopausal women is found to actually hurt patients, not improve their health. And so maybe you're saying at this point, well, then we should just learn from practice. But unfortunately, um, human practice is part of an imperfect system. We have clinical devices that famously now during COVID don't function equally. If you have darker skin, maybe pulse oximeters aren't going to report the right numbers for you. We have clinical interventions that were often designed for majority populations. And so, uh, you know, there have been a lot of really good papers recently that have shown that standard risk assessments don't work well for everybody. And then clinical diagnostics were often defined um, based on, again, limited populations. So for this reason, female patients have a disproportionately low heart attack survival when male doctors treat them. And we'll come back to that example later. And so here's machine learning in health 101. We collect data on patients who are sick, right? Maybe that data is faulty, but so what, right? At least we have something. And then we predict when bad events or outcomes like getting sicker, developing sepsis in the ICU happens. And this is a really popular thing to do in case you're, you're unaware, right? So in the past 10 years, machine learning researchers have really engaged in this field. There's lots of mainstream ML conferences, and then also sub-conferences that focus on just health and machine learning that have uh, really impactful work going on. And it's not just research, models are now regulated advice givers, right? So the FDA clears algorithms. And so here's an example of a small set of the algorithms that have been cleared just in the past you know, few months um, in 2021. But what all of these papers to date really are doing is they're predicting bad events in sick people. So that's actually anomaly detection in anomalous data. Uh, so that's technically actually a really hard thing. It would be like saying, don't have any normal pictures of dogs and try to predict what a dog is. Only have pictures of dogs that have cones on their heads and try to predict which of the dogs with cones on their heads also have another condition. You have no idea what like healthy, happy playing dogs look like. So if we have no idea what it means for a diverse population of humans to be healthy, then the question is, what exactly are we learning? And so uh, that's what I'd like to focus on in, in my talk today. I'm going to skip over, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce one sort of technical thing that my uh, group is doing in this first category of research. Uh, what models are healthy, where we focus on building models that are uh, ro robust and they work well with heterogeneous data. Uh, I'll use it as a motivating example. So if we're trying to build models that are healthy, that means in, in my you know, view that they should be robust, private and fair, let's focus on privacy. So why am I going to focus on privacy? Because a lot of uh, people have rightfully said that anonymization is not robust to linkage attacks. And so um, if I assume that some bad actor uh, with bad intent goes through all of the training and downloads de-identified medical records, but then also has side channel information, they could potentially re-identify a record. How likely this is, is, you know, uh, others can, can comment on. There's a big debate about this. Uh, but it's, it's technically possible, right? And so there is a, a very big push in um, many machine learning settings to use a framework called differential privacy. So differential privacy was used by the US Census. Um, it's used by tech companies like Google and Apple to ensure that no information that you enter that they then use in a predictive model is too identifiable to you. So if you always type, potato after you type duck, duck, you always type duck, duck, potato, not duck, duck, goose. You would get kind of freaked out if later in another part of, you know, your, your, when you're searching for something, you type, why is a duck? And then the, uh, the autocomplete was duck, duck, or, you know, potato. And so, uh, differential privacy in a health setting works in the same way. Let's say a patient like Sumana is unique 
in her zip code, meaning there is no other person of her gender, race, and age in zip code 02138. So if those properties alone make her identifiable, then an adversary who can access data or the outputs of a model trained on the data could figure out that she has some medical condition that she doesn't want disclosed. Maybe she has a uh, sensitive condition or procedure, HIV or an abortion, and she does not want that disclosed. So uh, you, can imp you can use uh, differential privacy to ensure that no person's data is too obvious but the way that you do that is you uh, do something called uh, epsilon delta guarantees. And so uh, a neural network is trained by sampling a batch of data, seeing how well it predicts, you know, this, it, it gets initialized in some, I'm foggy, I'm a foggy brain state, samples some data, tries to learn to predict this task, right? Maybe it's mortality, dying in the ICU. I measure how well you do. And so I, I take a gradient, which is just the direction that the model should move in to become a better model. And then if I was not training with differential privacy, I would say, okay, fuzzy brain, take one step in the direction of this gradient towards a better brain. And then I sample a new batch of data, try to predict in this new sample, and then update the brain a little bit. And in this way, I move from a fuzzy brain that doesn't predict very well to a very good brain that can predict really well this thing that I, I wanted to predict. Differential privacy says, well, the problem is as you're doing this gradient, if you have a person who is too unique, they're going to pull your model around in a way that is much different than this uh, other set of people that are more like each other. And so how do I control that? I'm just going to clip and then noise it, okay? And so that's all it does. Differential privacy noises and clips a gradient when it's pulled too much around by this noisy, this sort of outlier data point. And so we evaluated what um, doing this, again, like state of the art uh, differential privacy technique does on this clinical prediction task. And the trade off is huge. It's not this huge in, in other settings, I will tell you, in vision, uh, in object detection, in vision, for example. But here we're going uh, in high capacity models like gated recurrent unit neural networks. Um, we're going from uh, performances that are very high. So between 0.8 and 0.9, it's very good for predicting mortality every year, right? Using only previous years as observed data to predicting almost no better than chance because 50, you know, sort of 50% is no better than flipping a coin and getting the event right. And, and that's really bad. That's a huge trade-off. And even worse, we find that, you know, the reason this happens is that, you know, we're noising and clipping. And so some of the training data is losing its predictive influence on test data when you add the privacy. But the patients, you know, these data points are not images or, uh, you know, um, text or something else that it's patient data, it's humans, right? And so some uh, samples, some points, some patients, some humans lose more influence than others. And so we find that adding privacy changes the most helpful group training data from black patients to white patients when you're evaluating on a black test patient. And that's really problematic for, for many reasons, um, but not least of all, uh, you know, the thing to think about here is that this isn't a, a bug. We didn't find a bug. This is working as designed. I just told you it's going to noise and clip anything that's too unique, right? Machine learning models in general, most of them, are built on finding patterns in data, extending those patterns, and then removing outliers that are probably noise. So that's how we go from, for example, looking at arms, hands, shirts, and uh, in these examples, and doing zero shot detection, for example, only seeing these classes and being able to predict completely unseen classes. It's by generalizing and extending these patterns. But what does it mean if a human is an outlier, right? Are we comfortable saying that that data should not have relevance to classification, that it should be noise, that it should be removed, that we just shouldn't predict on it as well? And that brings us into the second line of research uh, that my group has which is on what kind of healthcare is healthy. So this is where we say, forget about how fancy the model is. 
how do we make sure that it's working in a way that we're, we're comfortable with in this human facing setting? And so uh, the reason you should be very worried about this is because all of the data that we could ever gather about humans in health is biased. And that's because uh, doctors are humans and humans are biased, right? So if there's a bias that's in society, you're going to see it also in clinical care. And so one of the things we can do is do audits, check how uh, poorly a model performs on different populations. So you may have seen uh, many papers that do this very popular task of taking chest x-rays and predicting diseases like pneumonia or edema or pleural effusion, whatever they are. We tried something different. We said, let's take these three very commonly used large chest x-ray data sets. So that's over 700,000 images from three different sites in the United States. Let's train a convolutional neural network to predict no finding. So that's a label that's present in um, these x-ray data sets. That means I took an x-ray of the patient, but they're actually healthy. There's nothing wrong with them. And then we compare, we compare the false, false positive rate in different subpopulations. And why are we looking at a false positive? Because if a model falsely predicts a positive of no finding, that means the patient was actually sick and the model said that they weren't. And so it's under diagnosis. And uh, to be clear what the stakes are, higher model under diagnosis rates on one subpopulation like female patients would lead to a higher rate of no treatment in those patients if that model were deployed. So when we run this model on unseen test patients, so it's been trained on a large subset of the data, right? And now we're evaluating how well it does on unseen test patients and it, uh, it performs state of the art in other tasks. We find that there is a, large, uh, a larger underdiagnosis rate in female patients, in young patients, in black patients, and in patients on Medicaid insurance. And intersectional identities are often more heavily uh, underdiagnosed in aggregate groups. So black or Hispanic female patients are underdiagnosed more than white female patients. And you might say, okay, Marzia, but you just showed me how to audit this model. And now there are technical things you could do post hoc to try to balance this. Like for example, choosing a different operating point for every you know, subsectional um, identity that that you define as important to perform equally well across. So auditing fairness in, a, in these predictive models is something that people have started to turn to, right? Um, if you give me um, facets like ethnicity or insurance type or gender uh, and say, these are the things that I want you to demonstrate that you perform equally well on, I can audit my model and show you what the difference in uh, loss in accuracy is across them. And then maybe we can try to balance that post talk, right? But this is not easy to do. And so here's uh, my favorite example of that. So this is a paper a student did where they took a contextual language model. Um, and this one is called Cybert. It's a public model that's based on taking PubMed abstracts. So articles that are written uh, about health and science and are archived publicly in the PubMed archives. And so this is a, lang a language model that you can download now and play with if you want to. It's called SciBert, uh, S-C-I-BERT. And uh, what a contextual language model does, if you're not aware, is uh, it does language completion. And so if I give it a prompt, it can fill in the blank for me. And uh, contextual language models do this very well. So they can uh, do those uh, GRE, ACT, SAT, word association games and sentence completion at a very high level. And so uh, we took a real sentence from a real clinical note um, and just abstracted out the race that was reported and the two words that uh, the blank was filled in with. And so if I fill in the blank, Caucasian or white, Caucasian patient became belligerent and violent, sent to, the model fills it out with hospital, end of sentence. If I fill in the blank with African, African-American or black, the model completes the sentence with prison. This would be very hard to audit for, right? We found this because we were looking for it and we tried many different uh, sentence tags that were real prompts in clinical notes and that we knew were 
potentially uh, issues that um, people might be biased on anyway. And so the language model might have picked up on. We're not fully aware of how deeply our language in our clinical notes and in our, our scientific abstracts are biased. And so when we train models and say, look at the data that's there, copy the humans that, who did such a good job. Did we do such a good job? It's not clear, right? We don't have useful ways to audit human performance. We don't have useful ways to tell right now whether doctors are performing in a way that we would like a model to mimic. And so complex health is generating this really complex data ecosystem that we have to think about very carefully. And the last thing that I'd like to talk about is, you know, now that we know that there are these issues, let's think about human behavior, right? Because health is part of this complex system that's fundamentally motivated by behavior. So, um, there are many non-medical factors that influence care. And I mean, you know, forget, assume that the devices worked perfectly and the models worked perfectly, right? There are these really interesting studies that have demonstrated that physician patient race match reduces likelihood of in-hospital mortality. There's no reason that that should happen. Um, that black doctors are much more successful at getting black male patients to agree to diabetes tests or flu shots or cholesterol screening. And my personal least favorite, most favorite example is that gender concordance. So this means, you know, you are the same um, self-reported gender as the doctor that is uh, treating you increases a patient's probability of heart attack survival. But this effect is driven by increased mortality when male physicians treat female patients. So you don't have a lower survival rate if you're a male patient with a female doctor, you have a much lower survival rate if you're a female patient with a male doctor. Um, but, and this is a quote from that paper, by the way, and it's my favorite quote, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So the quote is, we find that mortality rates decrease when male physicians practice with more female colleagues or have treated more female patients in the past. So the second part makes sense. You get better at treating heart attack in female patients when you've seen more female patients because you understand that maybe the presentation is slightly different or you start listening to the actual words that your female patients are saying. The first part doesn't make sense to me. You get better when you practice with more female colleagues. And the only explanation I have for this is that, you know, it's, it's like a dose response thing. Women are like a drug where the more you're around us, the less you wanna kill us, which is maybe a great thing or a terrible thing. So the question I think to, to put to us in sort of the modeling world is how much do we think uh, behavioral variation is going to impact care when models are providing advice? And so this is my, uh, my sort of motivating study. I remember hearing about this study when I was an undergraduate and just being shocked by it because um, in my, in, in maybe like the, the very, you know, most hopeful back part of my mind, I, I had thought, but money is more important to people than racism, right? Uh, so this is a, a really famous study uh, that was done a decade ago that showed that um, if you do an eBay auction for, uh, that's what an iPod used to look like for the students who don't remember what an iPod is. Um, white hands holding an iPod received 21% more offers than black hands holding the same iPod. So they started at the same listing price and the, uh, the same, it's the same iPod. The only thing that was different was the hand color holding it. I find this very depressing um, and then decided to mimic it in a way um, by saying, what happens when we have a model? All models would be wrong sometime. There's no perfect model. Nothing can be perfect because uh, we don't actually understand medicine well enough to do perfect classification every single time. So assume a model will be wrong occasionally. Okay. What is the difference in how experts and non-experts behave when they believe that it is a machine learning model giving them advice? versus when they believe that it's a human giving them that same advice. And so here we varied two things, whether we said it was an AI or a human giving the advice, it was us in, it was always us, right? There was no AI involved in this. We made all the advice. 
And then we varied whether it was inaccurate or accurate advice. So sometimes it was correct and sometimes it was incorrect. And we measured two things. We showed um, two different kinds of clinicians, radiologists who are experts and IMEM doctors who are not experts, but they see x-rays. Uh, we showed them eight cases each. And then we uh, measured whether they were correct in judging the actual uh, diagnosis for the patient and also what their perception of the quality of the advice was. And we found that experts actually rate AI advice much lower than human advice even though it's the same advice, right? And we did not find this effect for the non-expert doctors. However, they have very similar accuracy. So here are the radiologists, very similar case accuracy. Here are the IMEM doctors, very similar case accuracy, whether you give them in green AI advice or in orange human advice, it's the same advice. We're just saying one is human and saying another is AI. What's maybe more concerning is that physicians across expertise levels fail to dismiss incorrect advice really frequently. What I mean by this is that while experts have better diagnostic accuracy, so here you can see you know, about half of them get seven out of eight cases correct, that's great. Um, and far fewer IMEM doctors get seven out of eight cases correct. If we look at these, uh, the color of these bars, what they indicate is whether that particular case had correct or incorrect advice. And so if it was correct advice, it's blue. If it was incorrect advice, it's red. And so if, uh, if you see only blue bars, that means that that radiologist or down here, that IMEM doctor only got cases where all of the advice was correct, correct. Every time we gave them incorrect advice, they took it. And we have a similar level of susceptibility across both expertise levels. So that's really concerning um, because we, we care about all of these things if we're trying to make an ethical sort of uh, machine learning and health pipeline. We care about you know, the problems that are studied, the data we collect, the way you define an outcome, how you develop the algorithm. But we also care about these sort of post-deployment considerations like, well, how is it actually going to be used when I put it into a clinical setting? Um, and this is really an ongoing process. It's going to require really deep engagement, but I wanna focus on data collection because it's uh, a hot topic right now and say uh, all data is really valuable. You know, Data is very important um, for decision-making, for modeling, but health data, which is embodied, it's from human bodies is particularly valuable. And private companies can buy de-identified health data really easily right now in the United States but publicly funded or, you know, like uh, academics at um, institutions around the United States cannot. So it's really difficult for me as an academic to purchase de-identified health data at the same scale that Amazon or Google or Facebook are able to really easily. And if we want uh, academics to be able to audit um, and investigate the performance of models that are put out by private entities, then we need to have access to the same data so that we can train these robust private and fair models. Health is really lagging as compared to other machine learning subfields and reproducibility. So if you look at general machine learning, if you look at computer vision, if you look at natural language processing, machine learning for health really lags in releasing code so that everybody can run the analyses you said you ran, um, releasing data. So everybody, again, you know, it's de-identified and I can, you know, click play on your code and reproduce the graphs in your paper and on leveraging multiple data sets because there's not a lot of data that's available to researchers. We also have a couple of papers out that, um, you know, my, my own private, and it's because I've had companies try to call me and like headhunt me and say, you should come work for my company. I already purchased this large data set and I'm very salty that that's their, that's their like bargaining chip that they have access to this data that I think should be you know, publicly available like CMS or VA data. Um, and people often tell me, well, why don't you just use synthetic data? And uh, that's because as we show in a, showed in a paper earlier this year, synthetic data is not a robust solution to um, biased and small data sets. So if you supplement or replace a data set with synthetic data, it doesn't mitigate the fairness concerns that were caused by 
the bat, the imbalances, the biases in the original data set. And if you think about it for a minute, that makes sense, right? If I generate synthetic data from the source data and try to balance it, it's not possible to completely account for all of the different factors that are causing um, sort of this, this bias perception. And even worse, perhaps, is that uh, post hoc balancing doesn't work well either. And so if you work in a representation learning space, um, you know, if you do deep metric learning and embed to, uh, to some metric space and then have a rebalanced uh, downstream task, you perform with the same asymmetry. If you don't work in this space, that's fine. The, the takeaway from this is that if you start out with imbalanced data and you build a middle representation, so let's say I am a large um, government or private company, but I have very imbalanced data. It has 10% women in it. And I build a representation, which is this sphere that I get to map all my data points to. And I don't want to release my data. So I just throw this representation out there and say, everybody map your own data to this and then do your, your downstream classification task for mortality, for example. Um, if I have a balanced data set, so half male, half female, it won't ever perform in a balanced way if I map it to this imbalanced uh, embedding space that was created. And again, this makes sense if you think about it, because if you have a sphere that uh, is where people should get mapped to, right, red points here, blue points here, and you have a, a sensitive attribute where there's just a hole in the model, right, that, that part of the sphere is just not filled in, you'll never be able to map to it well, right, because you didn't learn in the first place how to map to that area. And so you'll always be underrepresented even when you try to map balanced training data to that space in a downstream task. And uh, finally, I would like to say, you know, the things that I've talked about today are sort of the tip of the iceberg. The community is starting to engage in, I think really deeply and really well um, in these kinds of important, um, you know, ethical ML pipeline issues, but we still haven't really tackled a lot of these things that lie below the surface. And I, I think we need to get to them eventually. Um, I also think though, one of the positive things about doing this work, uh, which is positive, you know, I think work in a positive direction with a, a fantastic lab of students and uh, technical and clinical collaborators is that we are actually creating actionable insights in human health because the reason all of these uh, problems are coming up is they've been problems for decades, right? It's not like machine learning models are creating bias in health. They're just shining a light on what has been there. And maybe now that we have this conversation starter of, do you want to kill a robot that is biased against some patients? We can use that to refocus back to but it's biased in that way because it's being trained with human data that is already killing those kinds of patients. And so we can address that and move on to better health. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Great, um, thank you so much for the incredible talk. Um, the floor is open for questions. Uh, can we just ask questions, shall we, or should we? I think so. We can just, uh, I guess we can have a raised hand and then I can call on people. So feel free to start, Malin. All right. Well, thank yeah. you, Marze, for a wonderful presentation. I wanted, I was very intrigued that you included um, in your uh, studies also this AI versus human. Uh, as well as uh, all the other ways uh, that we end up discriminating. And I mean, it's, it's just uh, very interesting that you're taking it in the same framework. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to understand, um, you know, whether it is, because, you know, when we talk about fairness, uh, generally speaking, we think about it from the perspective of historical injustices and so on and so forth. But in the AI versus human case, um, I was wondering if the right, you know, fairness is the right frame, or is is there something else that should be? Because in you know there, there are those um, science fiction type episodes, and, and they're fascinating. Yeah. 
So I, I'm just trying to understand. It's just very fascinating to think about it. Uh, and I just wanted to hear your take, whether you're looking at it from a fairness perspective or you're looking at it sure. from a... Yeah, I, I think that the, um, the reason we had um, thought to do that experiment is, uh, and we weren't actually thinking of being fair to the AI, right? Like, you know, we, we're not, we don't think it's, we're hurting its feelings. Um, the thought was, there have been some studies that have shown that people are more susceptible to AI-based suggestions when the model is able to explain itself. And uh, very good studies that have shown that um, when a model makes a mistake, for example, in estimating the cost of a particular apartment um, and it can't explain itself, then people catch it. They're like, oh, model, you, you're so stupid. That would never go for that cost. But when the model can explain itself and say, oh, but it's so many bathrooms, good location, they go for it. They, they don't catch the mistake. And so uh, part of the reason we wanted to run that study was to see how susceptible were experts and non-experts to advice uh, that they thought was generated from an AI when the AI could not explain itself, right? All it has is just like this, this text. Um, and we found, uh, we, we had planned several follow-up experiments that we're doing now, but the difference was so large in whether people said they trusted the AI or not. Um, and then the susceptibility was similar across AI and humans or AI and human reported advice. And so we ended up putting that out as a standalone paper because we did not expect to find this. And now we're looking into, you know, okay, you say you don't trust it, fine. That's not how you're acting, right? And so I think we have this really weird situation with AI where we, we're telling it, do as I say, not as I do, literally. We're telling it, treat all patients well. And it's looking at this historical data and saying, well, that's not what this is showing me, right? Or we're saying, you know, complete all sentences fairly. And we're like, it's like, but really, that's not what this data is telling me to do. And so I think we're in this really weird space. Uh, we're in lots of other settings. If I see a thousand pictures of a Labradoodle, I want any um, newly generated Labradoodle to look like one of those Labradoodles, right? Or like an amalgam or an extension of the Labradoodles. But we are in a space where we're showing, you know, lots of Labradoodles and saying, we don't really like Labradoodles, actually. We think that you should generate only Huskies, right? They're both big dogs. Why don't you just do that? And so I do think we're in a, a very strange space where humans are interacting with the systems that are generating data. And then we're telling models to use that data. And then we're upset when the model does exactly what we told it to. I mean, there's so much uh, uh, fascinating things to follow up here on. And I may just, uh, if I may just follow up one more time and then I'll, I'll keep quiet and let other people ask questions. But uh, so you, you may uh, recall this is a very famous uh, Twitter thread started by Jeff Hinton on, you know, the, the human uh, being 80% accurate versus a model being 90% accurate. And, the human can explain itself, but the model is more accurate. And there's so many responses on that. But some that uh, struck me were more where um, some of the responses were saying, I wouldn't trust the model because uh, the model uh, may be less accurate for women or the model may be less accurate for people of color and so on and so forth. And therefore the human is what I would trust and so on and so forth. That's some of the responses. And I wonder if you've asked why uh, there's a difference in the trust uh, placed on the model versus human, whether these sorts of reasons for why uh, people responded differently to the model versus human, meaning that they were referring to some, some of the well-known issues of bias and so forth that they knew about or were, were there other underlying reasons? I think uh, my, my opinion is that uh, we don't like acknowledging how uh, poorly healthcare works for many people. Um, if you speak to clinicians, so I, I have a lot of, I, I was very naive when I started my PhD, I'm no longer. 
uh, if you, I have a lot of uh, friends who are clinicians that I, I do my research studies with, and they'll tell me things like, oh yeah, that, that risk score was defined in the seventies on 20 young white men from Yale. Oh, that one that was defined in, you know, 1975 on 30 young white men from Oxford. I mean, this, this is how medicine was created. This is how we decided what normal body temperatures are, you know, normal heights and weights and lab values and all of these things that we think are normal and healthy. They were defined honestly at a time where we thought reference physiology was a young white male at a, a fancy uh, undergraduate institution. Um, that's not, that's not actually what most people look like. Right. And so I think uh, we're not comfortable as a society accepting how, how much deviation there is from that in uh, normal human living. Uh, you know, normal, I'm a normal human, but I, I am, I've never yet seen a clinical study that includes Western Asian women as a key demographic in their studies, right? Like there's, there's not a lot for me to draw on when, for example, I want to know whether it's normal for Western Asian women to have gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Anecdotally, people will say like at an epi level in this country, which is in Western Asia, it seems like it happens more often, but is that environment or is that the person, right? And so I, I do think that as, as a group of people, as, as humans, we need to decide that we accept that healthcare is not perfect, that our knowledge of medicine is actually kind of sparse and has been defined historically on a very, very small, well-defined population. And we need to move beyond that. It's, you know, there's no point in say in like, you know, saying that, uh, that we, we should go back to thinking about things that way. Right. I think we just need to expand. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, there's one more question uh, from Monica and Troy, who's asking, what is your comment on social media data used for building machine learning for disease detection, say mental health? I have, I have so many thoughts about this. Uh, so I should say these are non-expert thoughts because I, I have not done it. Um, I have a, a good friend who has done it in her research. She gave me a couple of the caveats that I will now you know, uh, convey to you secondhand, um, which are, you have to be very aware of the population that has access to social media and has the time, internet connection and mobile devices often on a regular basis in order to report information on social media. Also, there is a, uh, maybe a specific population that's comfortable self-reporting some conditions on social media because they are very confident that they won't be targeted for reporting that, right? So if I am a fancy, you know, like a, a hospital or, um, you know, university or tech company employee, maybe it's, it's sort of cool right now for me to report, I have struggled with mental health too. Here are my tips for that. Or, you know, that's very accepted. People will say, good, good, you know, good job. That's not true for everybody. That's not true for all subpopulations. And it's certainly not true for all jobs. And so those are the caveats that I have uh, been made aware of from friends I have who do a lot of research in the social media space. I don't think that means you shouldn't use it. I think that means just like I now have a depressing familiarity with all of the issues that might occur when I do research in the HR space. When you do research in the social media space, be very well aware that um, you're looking at a slice of data that may only be representative for certain people. It is very cool though, right? Because if you could get people, if you could get everybody in the world a cell phone and reliable internet access, and you could ask them once a day to say how they're feeling, that would be the best data. It really would, right? Because then we could actually have a better sense of how often do people around the world, different ages, uh, different identities, feel happy, feel sad? What is it most correlated with? 
Is there just a lot of variation within an individual? Do some individuals vary more? There's been a lot of press, you know, in the social and psych space about how a lot of that research is based on weird individuals is what they call it. It's Western educated, you know, industrialized, developed countries, right? Um, it would be really interesting to see. I've really enjoyed, there, there are a couple, there's one paper that Emma Pearson put out about reporting on menstrual cycle that has a reasonable global sample. Um, they, they deployed these apps to different places and you know it's an app deployment, so it's going to be a more privileged population, financially privileged population, no matter which country we're talking about. But I thought that the data was really cool. Uh, so I think there's a lot of hope for it. Um, thank you. If there are more questions, please free to, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. Um, I'll go. Everyone else has a question. Yep. Hi. Um, great to meet you, and, and, and thanks for the, the cool talk. Um, I was hoping to follow up on this point about the uh, the, the massively cooler data sets, right? Um, you spoke a bit about differential privacy as sort of a, a kind of solve um, for sort of the, the dark side of collecting a lot of data on a lot of different groups of people. Um, and I was just curious sort of what you see as sort of a next step there. Obviously, diff privacy has its problems. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, uh, inferring sentiment based on what people type on their iPhones, uh, which has been sort of a popular, a popular, uh, uh, I guess, fairness machine learning problem recently. Um, so differential privacy is sort of making massive data sets more private to analysts has its flaws. What do you see as sort of the next step? I think that uh, differential privacy, so this is, uh, there are a range of opinions actually on differential privacy and privacy in general in, um, in healthcare data. I, I'm going to give my own, um, but I, I recognize there are different opinions here. I think that the, um, the level of uh, control that's enacted in restricted data sets that are de-identified um, is sufficient for academics um, and we do not need differential privacy. And I'm saying that because as an academic, you if you uh, lose data, uh, there, there's actually really severe repercussions. And if you lose your lab, you kind of lose everything, right? So your reputation's a, a pretty big deal and your ability to handle data in the way that it is supposed to be handled is a pretty big deal. Um, and also, what is the concern? The concern is that I have access to other data and I can join that. And then that I don't want that. I, as an academic, often A, don't have access to other data um, because how, right? And also B, even if I had it, how would I know it's the same person? Um, private companies do, right? When Facebook or Amazon or Google or any other company uh, buys cell phone tower data, they know who is who in that de-identified data set. And so differential privacy makes a lot of sense in those spaces because those organizations have other data that is often deeply private, that is very easily, trivially joined to data that's coming in. Um, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, these, these technical fixes, sometimes people propose a technical fix for something and you sit there and go, there's a, there's like a human fix for that. That's it. So I got this question during uh, the height of the pandemic at a panel where they said, you know, don't you think that we could use AI to detect um, which faces were not wearing masks properly. And then like doing a push notification to their phone and saying like, pull up your mask. I'm like, no, just have consistent messaging on wearing masks and give people masks. Like those were both not available for a long time during the pandemic. Like this is a trivially solvable thing without technology and technology is gonna make it worse. So I, I do think that differential privacy is a necessary tool for many private industry applications. I don't want Google who has my calendar and my location to also have access to my medical record and uh, you know my cell phone. I don't want that, 
right? But I think that um, the de-identification procedures that we use in the United States uh, under HIPAA for safe harbor, in my opinion, are sufficient for academic groups. But that's it. That's my, that's my, so I'll get off my soapbox. Building on that, I had one question. Are people actually now building better pulse oximeters or are we still in a place where we're going to ask AI to account for better noise oh. models? Oh my God. I, I just, I just had a consultation with a, a, there's a startup and there's this thing that matches, you know, student startups with like professors to give them advice. And I just had a consultation with this startup where um, they showed me some performance and I said, oh, this is, this is so great. Good job, students. Um, did you audit it by subgroups? They said, no. I said, okay, do that. It'll be fast. Show me how well you do. And they showed me there were gaps in subgroup performance. I said, well, you should probably fix those. And they said, ah, but the FDA doesn't check. Like the FDA doesn't ask for you to have equal performance across any specific subgroup. So we're good. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, no. So I, I think that there's, you know, honestly, I'm thinking, you know, for your own sanity, don't you want to fix this? Uh, but I think that there's a strong case after having this meeting to be made that you need to, to use both the carrot and the stick approach here. I, I do hope, and there are some, uh, like the, the Delphi AI or the consort AI, there are some guidelines that are coming out that are strongly recommending that AI solutions should be audited by subgroup performance. I'm uh, very happy about this and then a little annoyed because I'm like, well, why aren't devices audited this way? Why aren't human doctors audited in this way? I would be very comfortable if all doctors received a yearly report that I could access, it's publicly available, that says what proportion of their you know, different population patients died after 30 days. It's a Medicare reporting thing, right? Hospitals don't get reimbursed for it. If every single minority female patient you see always dies within 30 days, I don't wanna go see that doctor, right? And I've heard these things as word of mouth from clinicians that I work with, right? Like they'll tell me because I, I live in this area and uh, my kids have had health concerns and they'll give me advice and say, don't go see Dr. Kasimi right? Like, Ooh, not for your minority female daughter, right? Like you don't, you don't want her to say, if you know that, why is that person still practicing? And so I think the, the incentive system for things that are sub AI that build into it are actually very poor to perform well across different subgroups. And so what I'm really hoping is going to happen is by trying to regulate and understand how to make AI more fair, we actually finally have to take a look at the systems that AI is learning from, like human doctor performance and clinical devices and say, wait a minute, like these things aren't fair. Don't we want to try to audit or fix these as well? Thank you so much. Are there other questions? Yeah. yeah, so uh, I have a question. Yeah, thank you for the for the excellent talk. And um, this this topic reminds me of something that I'm also uh, so I was actually discussing this with a nonprofit, and it turns out that they have such uh, uh, like different performances for two different subgroups. But then uh, what they are facing is the other group. It's very hard to collect data from the, on the other group, and that's why the performance is always bad. And um, yeah, so, so uh, I mean, any thoughts about what happens when the difference in performance is because in one, for one of the group, we cannot really collect uh, uh, like uh, reliable data. What, what, what do you do then? I, I didn't quite catch the, maybe the, the middle part there. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a similar, um, so this is also regarding some health uh, prediction. Mm -hmm. However, they have seen that there's like a difference in how the model performs on two subpopulations. But to correct that, they might need to collect more data from the other population. I, so you're and saying- that, That's a challenge, that's a challenge. Right. 
I do think that uh, sampling, right? Like addressing data sampling issues is an important thing to do. So uh, this is like the All of Us project uh, that's being started uh, and I think co-led by the Broad here at MIT. I think they're doing a really good job. Like they've worked really hard to make sure they have a representative sample of the US population, um, which I, I have to tell you is incredibly hard to do, right? Like it's not like the reason that RCTs are all defined on, you know, white educated men is, is because of, you know, all pure nefarious evil. It's really easy to recruit that sample. It's really, they, they have the free time, right? Like it's, it's just easy, right? And so if you're a researcher who wants to figure things out, needs to get data, you know, how are, um, a clinical collaborator and I wanted to do a study on pregnant women. And we put together this assessment and then went to the um, obstetrics practice at Mount Sinai in New York. And uh, the obstetrics nurse had to walk us through and say, if you include this, no poor woman will enroll in your study because Medicaid doesn't pay for it. If you include this, no working mom will enroll in your study because it adds in 10 minutes. And 10 minutes is that critical point that turns a lunch appointment into a, I have to skip a day of work appointment. Like just all of these factors of, we are thinking we wanna get this much data on every pregnant woman, you know, every single obstetrics visit. And they're telling us when women book their appointments, they book with these factors in mind. And so if you add this, that population is gone from your, your study. I had no idea. I did not know this, despite getting a PhD while being pregnant, right? Like a different set of considerations. And so I think unless you really deeply engage with why populations are being excluded, and it, these aren't simple reasons, right? Like I didn't know these things, despite being a person that might've been recruited for this very same study previously. I think you have to really talk to people on the ground who might have a better understanding of why a population might or might not be able to participate and then work really hard to engage them. Yeah, thank you. I also have a question. Can you hear me from here or am I? Yes. Or, or I guess, where is the microphone? I'm sorry. Um, so I have a question regarding the USAI uh, say, uh, study because like we have also conducted a lot of human AI interaction studies, but more in like not expert domains like with crowd and we've also seen a lot of over-reliance. Um, so do you think that there might be some sort of like, because there are a lot of factors like the, agree the agreeableness score of um, like humans who are interacting with, with the AI, like how, what expectations they have from the AI and so on. So there's a lot of like in the psychology side of the human that's going on here. So do you think that there are maybe uh, paradigm shifts, um, design explorations here, for example, instead of uh, producing the final decision from the AI, having a more sort of like the AI communicating what the yeah. data is composed of, uh, where this suggestions are coming from and not maybe only the final sort of like this person has this certain disease or not. Yeah, no, no, I, I think so. And I think that's what many people are trying to figure out, right? Um, I think that there's maybe three things to think of. Number one, in every setting, it will be different. So the, what you need to communicate and how you need to communicate it will probably vary depending on whether it's a emergency setting where you need to assess the risk of sepsis or a family health setting where you're trying to assess if there's a risk of intimate partner violence or in a um, outpatient setting where you're trying to assess a risk of acute renal failure in the next year. Like what you show a clinician or clinical staff in each of these settings, I think probably will and should vary. How you show it is very interesting right? Because we have these other studies in non-medical settings that are showing that if the model explains itself, you don't catch mistakes as well. But in our study, we found that no explanations, just showing like, like, you know, advice, people, um, uh, experts don't like 
taking AI advice. They, they think it's bad advice, but they're, they're, you know, just as accurate under it. Um, we do have one study in an EMS setting, like an emergency medical services setting where we varied something really tiny. We either had the model say, and the model is evil. It always tells people to do the wrong thing. I feel actually, it's the only study I've ever done where I feel sort of bad. And like, you know, in the ethics approval, I said, we'll, we'll tell people that we're really sorry for exposing them to this model and that, you know, it's for the good of humanity. Um, but in that, you know, it's this sort of like evil model that says like, always do the wrong thing. It's, it's always, a, and like the mean, the, the biased wrong thing, like always, you know, report uh, the, the black patient, like always, you know, save the white patient. Um, so this evil model is, is you know, advising, uh, is advising people. It's very, it's very depressing study. Um, and what we found is that if you tell people that the model advises you to do like, and that's the word it directs you to, or it advises you to do, and then you say this bad thing, people follow it and they, they do the bad thing. But if you just say it using the same evil model with the same bias, the model has like a flag or like things that they're, 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 you know, so if, if it's in the context of violence, right. If we're saying that we think uh, in one setting, we say you know, the model thinks you should call the police on this patient. But in the other, we say the model has a flag for increased violence. People don't behave the unbiased way when we say that there's a flag, but they do behave in a really biased way when we say that, well, the model thinks you should call the police. When the model advises you, when it tells you something, and this is the uh, this is the setting that's most close to the um, the real estate thing, right? Where they said, well, the model thinks it should go for like this price. I I wonder if there's like a set of pre advising, pre directive, right? Like I don't know, less normative advice, more descriptive advice that needs to be generated, so that when a model is evil like this one, super biased, people they can still separate it out. They're like. Eh, I don't think so versus, okay. Right. Like, I guess, you know, this is, it must be based on something, you know, uh, that I don't have access to knowledge that I don't have access to. So, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting area of study. More work should be done in this space. Thank you. Great. Um, I guess there are no more questions. Thank you so much for the talk, Marzia. Uh, and for taking all this time. It was incredible and very insightful. Any last comments? No, thank you everyone for inviting me. Um, and I hope some of you are planning to work in this space in the future. It's a, it's a great place to be in. Thanks so much. Thank you.